Welcome back to Maryland Health Today. I'm Ellen Beth Levitt. On the show today, we're talking about some common conditions that cause blockages in blood vessels in the legs and ways to treat them. My guest is Dr. Ziv Haskell. He's the Chief of Vascular and Interventional Radiology at the University of Maryland Medical Center. And Dr. Haskell is also a professor and vice chairman of diagnostic radiology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. And I've heard that an estimated 10 million Americans have a condition called peripheral arterial disease, or PAD. Some people call it claudication. Could you tell us, please, what is peripheral arterial disease? Claudication is a small piece of peripheral arterial disease. We have a lot of arteries. We have arteries in our legs, in our arms, and that's what we call peripheral, and blockages in them, most typically in the arteries of the legs, or some people include kidney arteries as well, get included in this diagnosis of peripheral arterial disease. The term that you mentioned, claudication, is a very specific one for a pain in the calves or the thighs that comes from having a blocked artery. And it's real simple, it's like traffic. You have a blocked artery, you exercise, which means you demand more blood to that working muscle, and that narrowed or blocked artery can't supply more blood flow to it. So you get pain. People take a rest, the pain goes away, and they start to walk again, and they may hit a certain distance or a certain number of stairs at which that pain returns again. Rest, disappears, do it again. And that's claudication. That's a very typical symptom of peripheral arterial disease. So the symptoms are when you're walking, um, as you walk more, you get more pain and so forth, and you feel like you need to rest. Um, some of the other symptoms are up here as well. Your legs might feel cold, is that right? Or um, you might feel some numbness occasionally? With chronic uh, peripheral arterial disease and blockages in those arteries, you may notice the loss of hair in the leg. Very often patients will not describe it as pain, but a, an actual tightening in the calf or the thigh or pain around the knee in some cases which you might attribute to arthritis and in fact there are a lot of things that may mimic these types of pains sure. from disc disease to arthritis and we probably underdiagnose we know that we underdiagnose PAD because we think it might be these other things symptoms of aging or arthritis when in fact it really is PAD and treatment would be a different if we knew. Condition, sure. What's causing these blockages? Is it blood clots or are these more the fatty deposits that you might see in it's that It's that western diet. It's that uh, cholesterol rich diet that we uh, that we live and enjoy that causes these fatty deposits in our arteries. Are some people more at risk than others? Well, it certainly increases when you get older, but uh, the same types of risk factors that increase your risk of uh, heart attacks like smoking, um, high blood pressure as well can be associated with uh, PAD. And people who have diabetes as well? Very much so. Arterial disease is increased in, in uh, diabetic patients. What kind of tests do you perform to diagnose peripheral arterial disease? Well, the first question is, do you suspect it? Are you one of those 10 million? And there's a very, very simple test called the ABI, the Ankle Brachial Index, which is actually a comparison of blood pressure in the thigh to a blood pressure in the arm. And the ratio between that can tell us, in fact, whether you have some reduced blood flow in the legs. It's a simple test, and in fact, the American Heart Association published some guidelines, which I was the co-chair of a few years ago, that made some very specific recommendations that Patients over 50 who have some of the risk factors we said, or arguably everyone over 70 should have this test to look for PAD, and the ABI test. And it's just a simple ultrasound test, right? With a blood pressure cuff. Yes, you need right. to be trained to do it. And this year we'll actually be rolling out a large national program to try to put these guidelines in place and to get frontline physicians to be able to use these tests to screen their patients so that you could get that screening information from your doctor and perhaps not have to figure out on your own that you need to see a vascular specialist. So how is this treated? Well, it really depends on the symptoms. And if we break it down into two groups, which is lifestyle limiting pain or actual tissue loss. Tissue loss we call critical ischemia. That's the ulcer that won't heal. That's the person who might, in fact, untreated have a leg at risk even for amputation and we consider that actually if you will the heart attack of the leg and it turns out that there's very often an average of months of delay before referring a patient with 
critical limb ischemia, potential limb loss to a vascular specialist. So the first question is if you've got that, it's making sure that you're in touch with somebody who can treat it. For claudication, if you've screened, if you've been screened and have that abnormal ABI, I think it's important to see a vascular specialist. We do have a lot of very potent, less invasive treatments than we had years ago to be able to reopen arteries in the legs, ones that don't require surgery that can be done with catheters, with little tiny tubes the size of a pencil tip. And you actually brought some stents along. Do you use stents? A lot of us have heard about stents that are used in angioplasty and vessels around the heart. But um, are these stents also able to be used, and are they beneficial for people who have this claudication problem? Very much so. There are lots of different types of stents, and stents are arguably one of the more important uh, inventions of the last century. Uh, I'm an interventional radiologist, and that means that I use tiny little tubes the size of the tip of pencil to, and moving x-ray cameras and other tools to be able to fix things like abnormal arteries and veins. And I treat a lot of peripheral arterial disease without surgery. And some of the things that we do, and these are just some of the types of stents, and there are many, many different ones. You can see how flexible Looks they are. It's like a little slinky. It does, and you can also see that you can make it into something really, really small. So everything goes in without surgical incisions. And this is actually a very interesting one. We have these in much longer lengths, but you see that it's white. And in fact, this particular one has Gore-Tex, the same thing that we have on clothing. It's called a stent graft. We can actually put this liner inside of a narrowed or blocked artery to prop it open and prevent those fatty tissues or deposits from actually getting through. And this type of inside the blood vessel bypass without an operation has really been a, a compelling advance in, in the tools that interventional radiologists have to treat PAD. And that just stays right in the vessel. It does. It does. The, the stent actually supports and presses open, but when you have the surrounding graft, or perhaps in the future even medicated stents may have some role in PAD, we can do some more local therapies to that rather than just push it back. When people have this, do they usually have just sort of one area of deposits in the vessel, or do they have multiple ones, and can you treat multiple ones as well? The extent of the disease certainly affects the types of treatment that we have, and as you can imagine, more extensive disease may lead to more extensive symptoms as well. So we do have newer abilities to treat very long ones, and the most affected arteries the types of people that you and I are talking about are really the arteries in the thigh from the, from the groin to the knee. That's called the superficial femoral artery, the SFA. We've got a lot of techniques and tools to reopen these arteries and keep them open now without operations. What's the recovery like if somebody has this treatment? Well, if it's a catheter-based treatment, such as one that an interventional radiologist would do, it's often an overnight stay. There's no surgical cutting or sewing. The incision might be the size of a pencil tip and usually four to six hours of lying flat in a bed afterwards to make sure that everything's nice and dry, and then hopefully you're up the next day and testing out your leg. Great. Now, I've heard that peripheral arterial disease can be a symptom that you might have coronary artery disease so that you might be more at risk of a heart attack or perhaps a stroke. Is that true? And that's a really important point because we have far more patients who have peripheral arterial disease than ones who necessarily should have treatment for it. Just because you have it doesn't mean that you need to have your leg treated. But what's far more important is that it's in fact a marker for having heart disease, that is coronary artery disease, or possibly disease in the arteries to bra into the brain, the carotid arteries. And you can see from that graph, the blue one is heart disease, the red one is uh, Carotid. Uh, carotid artery right. disease, and the yellow one is peripheral arterial, and they all meet in the middle. They overlap. They overlap, which means that, uh, that having PAD sets you at higher risk. It's a marker for coronary disease, and we'll often use that to make sure that all the things that you need for your heart disease, your cholesterol-lowering drugs, your statins, those medications that have been in the news in the last several days are as important for PAD patients because if you've got peripheral arterial disease, you've got hardening the arteries here, you potentially have them everywhere. Right, you could have them system-wide, and that might be a good sort of alert for you to know that you need to have further investigation, diagnosis, treatment, and so forth, because prevention, of course, is the key, right? 
And uh, diagnosis uh, has become a much less invasive one. We talked about a screening tool, which is the ABI test, but we also have uh, magnetic resonance and geography and even CAT scans that can show us detailed maps of the arteries. The days in which I did invasive angiograms, maps of the arteries to find out how extensive the blockage was before treating it are frankly gone. We can go in to fix something knowing exactly what we're going to face having mapped it in a non-invasive fashion. That's really interesting. The technology has just gotten so sophisticated, hasn't it? Yes, very much so. We only have a few seconds left, but for preventing these problems, lifestyle things, what would you recommend? Get with your regular doctor. Make sure your risk factors are controlled. Quit smoking. Think about fish oil, perhaps, if uh -huh. it's appropriate. Talk with your doctor. and Exercise, make maybe? Exercise is critical. Keeping a normal weight? eating lots of fruits and veggies. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps so as well. Right. There's a lot that we can do to prevent these problems. So, well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. My guest has been Dr. Ziv Haskell. He's Chief of Vascular and Interventional Radiology at the University of Maryland Medical Center. And Dr. Haskell is also a professor and vice chairman of diagnostic radiology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. If you have any comments or questions about this program, please feel free to contact me by email. The address is eblevitt at umm.edu. If you'd like to reach Dr. Haskell or any other University of Maryland physician, you could call this toll-free number, 1-800-492-5538, or visit the website where you'll find a great amount of health information and also be able to see other Maryland Health Today programs. That address is www.umm.edu. Take good care of yourself. We'll see you next time for Maryland Health Today. Thank you.